Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. This episode discussed the basics of real estate investment trusts or REITs as they're commonly called. It also touches on the broadening subsectors in real estate, the impact of inflation linked rentals, and where today's guest is currently finding opportunities in the sector. I'm Darius McDermott from Fund Caliber, and I'm delighted to be joined by Roger Quirines, who is on the Cohen and Steers European Real Estate Fund. Roger, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we thought maybe um, for our audience, we'd take a little step back, go back to basics and have you uh, give us an introduction to what is a REIT? What is a real estate investment company? What sort of types they come and what, you know, what different areas in the property market that you can invest in by these vehicles? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, so REITs are, are listed real estate companies um, that own an, and operate um, yeah, real estate assets, call it like that. They generally give investors an opportunity to invest in real estate indirectly and also to generate, I would say, a relatively good income, but also um, not only an income, but also some some value growth if, if the Times are good, of course. And when you say indirectly, you're buying listed companies that own assets as opposed to physically buying offices and warehouses and those that, that, that would be direct property investing. Yes, yes, definitely. I think the, the advantage of, of a REIT is, is in a way that, yeah, you don't have to do the work yourself. So you, you don't have to have that much knowledge about the underlying assets. You buy a company and in which the management team has yeah, the knowledge of buying the right, uh, the right assets and, and, and the right sector, call it like that. And it's quite a broad sector. And I think maybe... Maybe 10 plus years ago, we would have just thought of office, retail and industrial. But the sector's broadened out over that period. Would you, would, would you agree with warehouses and all those other sort of subsectors? Yes, definitely. I think um, if you look, um, especially to the US, but Europe, um, I think in the US, it's a little bit more advanced on, on towers and, and data centers. But I think in Europe, uh, logistics has, has come a long way nowadays. Um, hotels, uh, something a little bit more yeah, recent, I would say. But I think another sector I have to mention is self-storage, a sector yes. that's, that's not that much known in the yeah, direct market even, to be honest, but a sector that de yeah, definitely is very interested from a yeah, long-term growth uh, perspective. So indeed, income, but also yeah, kind of rental growth and, and, and from an, yeah, especially in supply demand perspective, it is something that, that fits very well in the, the recent trend of urbanization that people, you know, get yeah, smaller houses, but need more space and they, they kind of need yeah, a lot of storage to, to stuff their, uh, to put their stuff in. Yeah. And like most assets in 2022, um, the real estate market had a challenging period as, um, as rates went up with inflation. Uh, is it just inflation and those rising rates which caused, caused, caused that more challenging period over the last year or so? I think, yeah, I think the, the main challenge has been, I would say, the yeah, the, the, the fact that we come out of quantitative easing into quantitative tightening. And at, at the same time, we've had uh, yeah, significant inflation impact. So I would say, looking backwards, we could see inflation go, going up somewhat, which was, you know, I would say it's positive, especially for European real estate, because we're linked to inflation. But I think anything going from a deflationary environment to two to three percent inflation would have been perfect, but we all know that didn't happen. So we went from you know three to five, from five to yeah ten, and even very yeah uh, fifteen percent inflation some occasions. So so the inflation overshot, and I think that that is where yeah the whole market um, yeah uh, came in 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 some kind of headwind. So yes, 
that meant that that interest rates had to increase in the fastest pace we've seen in in 30 to 40 years. So I think that has had a negative impact um, on on especially real estate, um, especially the, the listed market first. So the listed market will correct the quickest the most and then the private market generally will correct later and in a yeah, slower pace i would say so i think yes um inflation and interest rates have been the main headwind over here and you did mention that inflation can actually benefit um real estate could you just give a, a very brief explanation as to how inflation benefits yeah, definitely. I think that's also why it's called real estate in in, in a way. Um, it's a real return, uh, but it's it's important, of course, a couple of things. It's, it's do you have pricing power? Um, do you have a prime asset? Um, so I think those those things are important. Demand and supply. So I think if you look at those fundamentals, um, they are for certain sectors and certain you know prime assets, um, even certain offices. We all know the working from home discussion um, are, are rather favorable. So rents are increased with inflation and most of the rents in Europe, not all in the UK, but I think if you look at Europe, both UK and the continent, there's a fair amount of rental contracts linked to inflation. The question then is, can you pass on 12% inflation? I think that it's a little bit getting a little bit tricky. So in January, what we see, they pass on around six to eight percent inflation. But in Sweden, for instance, they pass on ten percent inflation. Second question is, is that you know sustainable? Yeah. And I think this is where you know we do a lot of work, of course, as specialists, and we think yes, certain cities, certain sectors, again, it is sustainable. So I think that's very important. Um, and inflation is all lacking a little bit. So you see the rental contracts probably in 2023, still an acceleration in, in, in yeah, inflation increases. So generally speaking, I think, you know, that's the tailwind. The headwind is, of course, the higher interest rates. And then it's more about the balance sheets of the companies. Do they have a conservative balance sheet? Do they have long dated debt? So I think those things, if you all put it in the mix, yes, I think, you know, it's it's it, it can be a benefit. But at the same time, some companies you will see have a balance sheet, which is, you know, there's a bit too much leverage or they have short term debt maturities. And then, you know, the the tailwind also, there's a headwind of higher interest rates. So I think you have to uh, make a good judgment, um, whereas, yeah, the tailwind bigger than the headwind, call it like that. And, and what about recession? I mean, property generally, I mean, most asset classes don't do well in recession. Uh, yeah. Property, uh, you know, it, it is a real asset, whether directly or indirectly held, you know, and then you've got the whole working from home culture, which was alien to us yeah. only four or five years ago. Um, do, do you worry about recession or do you think actually across Europe that that might just be avoided and maybe on a valuation basis, we've already had some of the pain? Yeah, I think it's important to understand we can always invest in, in, in different asset classes. So we have defensive asset classes, which is more residential, healthcare, and we have more cyclical asset classes, which are more the offices probably, as you mentioned. Um, I think at this point, I'm, I'm less worried about a recession to a certain extent, because I think for us, a recession is a little bit necessary now. You see what the central banks are doing also to reduce the inflation. So I think it's important that the inflation peaks, the growth somewhat comes down, um, and then there's room for the interest rate to stabilize, if not come down a little bit. And I think our sector is less cyclical than other equities call it like that. So I think from that perspective, we've got generally long lease contracts, still the inflation link in there. So I think, you know, if that happens, a recession, I'm not that negative for our asset class. So we could or probably would be buying more German residential, um, prime retail even doing relatively well, um, giving out, you know, good dividend yields um, and probably a healthcare or so instead of buying more offices. So we, we, we've talked about some of the issues that have caused challenge um, to, to, to the asset class. 
what would be a potential catalyst? What would excite you about the real estate sector? Is it just that inflation-linked rental growth that you can enjoy? And as you already have started to do, you've touched on some of the, you know, it's you can move this fund around yeah. into more yeah. defensive parts of property or more cyclical as and when you see the time. What what might get property motoring again in, in the year ahead? Yeah, the, the, the good thing what you mentioned indeed is we move around, uh, it's liquid. So a couple of things, I think um, the portfolio is very balanced. It has been since COVID because with COVID, you know, we've had COVID we moved around, we've had Brexit we moved around. Um, and I think now what do we have? We certainly have since COVID a stronger focus on, on pure value, um, which is mostly retail. Uh, as, you, as, as you know, a lot of people didn't like retail uh, because of the obvious e-commerce reason. But I think we're kind of past that uh, station. I think we all know there's physical retail and there's, there's uh, digital retail. Yeah. Um, so if I look at the retail part and, and especially the prime shopping centers in Europe, we get a, you know, around an 8% dividend yield. Rents can increase with inflation. So I think, and they, and, you know, if I have a good balance sheet, I think that that's a good product. It's a good product, um, I would say. Uh, also compared to bonds, it's relatively uh, stable, even if there's a recession, I would say. So I think that's good. Then um, we have also a certain growth aspect in the portfolio, which we talked about is the self-storage that, that generally makes a, a very good total return, very strong pricing power. Um, look at the long-term returns, I would say, of those companies, self-storage companies. You, you might find them on the internet. Um, I think that's a bit cyclical. So if the recession comes, they might pull back. We have a, a overweight on the sector, but not a big one. So if that happens, I would definitely look to increase that weight at the time when the price is right. We always look at the relative value. So I think that's another one that makes me yeah, confident about how to deal with the uncertainties that are coming, to, to, coming towards us. Um, then um, the big question is a bit German residential in Europe. The balance sheets are not great, but it's extremely cheap. Um, so we added a little bit there. And I would say that's a little bit more opportunistic investing. So we think, you know, it's oversold. And we have a company that we, we've never owned before during the bull market. But we thought, you know, now it makes sense to own it. It's so cheap. We paid uh, two and a half sorry, 12 and a half times the rent. So that's around an 8% cap rate for German residential. That's far, far below replacement costs. Um, the company is selling assets um, at a relatively good price. So repairing its balance sheet. So that's really an opportunistic thing to do. And I think that's where we get relatively cheap access to an extreme defensive asset class. So an extreme defensive cash flow, um, with, which is not fully index linked, but I think once the inflation peaks, there's more room for rental growth to catch up with inflation again. So to catch up the lost inflation increases, call it like that. Um, and maybe just for our listenership, as we're based yeah. primarily here in the UK, yeah. you talk about German residential. Now, I know what you mean because I've been sitting on this side of the fence for 25 years or so. Maybe just explain to our audience that slightly different cultural um, renting versus owning that, that, that does go on in, yeah. in not just in Germany, but in Sweden and other parts yeah. of the continent. Yeah, I would say the difference between the UK and, and, and the rest of Europe is, is mostly regulation. Uh, so Germany is, is very much regulated with the meat speaker, although, you know, the meat speaker also goes up if, you know, there, there's a demand and supply imbalance, which there is. I mean, the whole of Europe, in, including the UK, has a huge shortage of, of residential, of course. Um, UK is a bit more fr uh, free. I think we, we, we look at the UK uh, PRS market. We can invest in it. We do like it, although the cash flow yield is a little bit low. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, I think they both offer some value, I would argue. Uh, and, and especially if we hit a recession, I think 
German residential is a little bit more defensive versus the UK um, PRS market, uh, call it like that. Because in January, because of all the regulation, the rents are relatively low, uh, probably yeah, 25% below market. So uh, maybe then if we could just close, you've got lots of subsectors and we've touched on self-storage, we've touched on German residential. Um, where are you seeing, because you've got a, a lot of subsectors you can pick from, where are you seeing the best value? Maybe you could explain some of the areas that are genuinely exciting you as we look forward um, over the coming years. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned retail. So I think it's a bit non-consensus. I think for yeah. now, at this time in the cycle, um, I would say retail. Why? Um, I think it, it's, a, it's a relatively high yield. So your implied cap rate is around uh, 7%. Um, you have growth. You have in the indexation. Um, it's not over-rented, but that means you go for the higher quality uh, retail and more on the continent than in the UK. I think in the UK... I'm a little bit more worried uh, here with the mortgage systems and then the higher impact or the impact of higher interest rates on the consumer. So I think for me, that's, that's the one, you know, where you get your 8% dividend yield. It is sustainable. You get an inflation link. I can also find a retailer on the continent that has a, a 10 to 12% dividend yield. Um, very convenient focus. So for your daily shopping, an average basket of around 10 euro uh, per customer. So I think very, you know, inflation proof, very recession proof. So I, I think, you know, if you, yeah, if you say I want something that generates a lot of cash, is relatively stable between eight and 12%, good balance sheets, you know, it, it won't grow a lot, but at least, you know, it's stable and it gives you what you want in this time. It's the cash flow. So I say real estate now, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. That will change when we're past peak inflation. When we go down, it will be also, again, the growth, the total return, all the other stuff. But today, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Roger, thank you very much for discussing European real estate and giving um, a bit of a, a learn as to, to what it is and, and the various subsectors that you have to choose from. This fund allows investors to gain exposure to the diversifying asset class of European real estate, knowing that it is supported by a replicable and robust process and is an experienced team at Cohen & Steers. For more information on the Cohen & Steers European Real Estate Securities Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. 